political ideologies. What is the political ideology? In the, I'm going to talk about two types of political ideologies, in the soft sense ideology and in the hard sense ideology. So let's talk with the soft, in the soft sense. And what, what does it mean? Ideology, a political ideology is a set of ideas, a comprehensive uh, uh, set of ideas about the goals a society should pursue and the means and ways through which it, those goals should be achieved. So it's a set of ideas that are more or less coherent, comp comprehensive and coherent, about where society should go and how we should get there. Right? This is why we call it an ideology. It's a set of ideas that we assume it's coherent. Well, most of the time they're not, right, by the way. But there are certain, uh, you know, backbones that make them, uh, give them a certain, uh, you know, unity to these political ideologies. Another definition is a comprehensive set of beliefs about the political world, about the desirable goals and the best ways to achieve them. So let's talk a little bit about the modern contemporary political ideologies. Of course, just a few. Your book also mentions others, so feel free to, to look through them. Now, what are the ideologies? Are sets of ideas about the world, about the political world, about how societies should act and organize themselves and which way they should go, basically. So, as you notice, they are rooted, they are basically rooted in certain basic assumptions about the world, about society, about the human being, about the economy, about uh, what is the purpose of life and what should we aim us towards together as a society. So, you know, political ideologies, this is why sometimes they're mentioned as philosophies, but they're not philosophy. <laughs> they're not as complex or subtle or intelligent as philosophies. They're basically work plans more than anything else. Um, <clears throat> but because they're philosophies and we're talking about modern political ideologies, uh, you see then that they belong to the modern world. The modern political ideologies that you have as choice are basically part of the same cluster that were formed around the time when the modern state was formed, when modern representative democracies were formed. So what we call today is political ideologies are basically were made yesterday. So these are not, this is what I'm trying to emphasize here. These are not some absolute realities that exist and have always existed. Was Aquinas a conservative? Was Plato a liberal? You see how absurd these questions are, right? Because they don't make sense, they don't make sense because these specific choices, they're not even choices today, by the way, right? we're gonna talk about. But I, I use them because they're the ones we usually talk about in the, in the United States as a political system, right? In this political system. But they're different choices in every single other political system. But anyway, the point is, they're modern. They're yesterday's uh, a joke that we continue on today. They're not some absolute realities. They were shaped by very concrete re re realities. Why? Because again, they were born within the modern nation state. When you, if you don't have the modern nation state, you don't have the ideologies that correspond to that. They were, they were born when the centralized state was created. Without a centralized state, you can't have certain ideologies that require the state to act in a certain way. Before you have a centralized, powerful, bureaucratic state with an all-encompassing bureaucracy, how, do you, how can you require the state to do this and this and whatever and provide benefits and whatever? There is no such state. There is no such bureaucracy. So we're stuck in this, this modern paradigm which was again invented when? Yesterday. Basically out of the French, French Revolution, 200 years. That's nothing. This is why we went and looked at all that map of the world, back to the ancient world with the white patches and whatever. And when, did, when, did there, when was there a strong centralized bureaucratic state? Never! Never! Okay? So, that's one. Then, what is this modern state? When does it come about? It comes about when we have industrialization, the modern, the modern economy based on the modern means of production. When, in, when um, the steam engine is invented, when capitalism comes about, the idea, capitalism didn't exist always. Capitalism as we understand it today, the idea of capital, this is again yesterday's invention, right? It never existed before as, as we have it uh, today in the same principle. Even the idea of accumulating capital as a goal would have seemed absurd in the Middle Ages. Absurd. Why would I do that? Because their view of life was completely different. Remember Augustine. My point in life is to get to heaven. What do I care if I accumulate money? Now, I want to be rich or not, I mean, you know, that's a different story. But the idea of accumulating capital as a goal, more and more, more than I need, more than I can spend, more than I can, that makes me rich, why? Right? 
And what happened usually, uh, actually in the Middle Ages is that we, even the rich people, before they die, they donate their money to monasteries and, 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 and churches and so on. Because, you know, that was an act of self-denial that they did before they died because they wanted to get to heaven. So, you see, this is a modern reality in which there is, a, there is the industry, you know, the modern industry with the machines, right? It creates another reality of the working class. The working class never existed the way it exists today. This, this idea that most of the people in the world today, their livelihood depends on someone giving them money every month. That's absurd. Most of the history, everybody had their own parcel and land and whatever, and that's what you lived on. Notice it was more secure. You know, this is why people talk about indentured, indentured, I mean, not, uh, wage, uh, wage slavery, wage, wage servitude. We are slaves in a way, right, according to these, to these uh, observers, critics. We are slaves who live, who, who are very life depends on someone giving them money every month. And if they stop giving you money, well, you're left with, as we all know, how do you pay your mortgage? How do you pay, you're left with nothing, right? It's not, it's a system based on day to day. But that never was the case. And it happened only because the masses of people migrated from the, from the lands, from the agricultural lands, to the city, where they become employed by a factory. The, in the land, they had their own piece of whatever, even if it, it was small. Or even if it wasn't theirs, they, they had the right to work it and live of it. And that's, that's, a, that's a benefit, but there's also a vulnerability. They didn't just move because they, you know, uh, you know, obviously there were advantages and so on. But I'm just pointing out that this idea of a proletariat, of a whole mass of people who work with their hands and whose li livelihood and life depends on month after month after month putting in the same thing and then they get paid by someone. That's new. So it created new, so new pro problems. This idea of huge cities never existed in the way we, we have it today. Huge cities and unemployment, <laughs> you know. This is, this, these are all new realities. So these quote-unquote political ideologies come as a result of new, these new phenomena, these you know, modern phenomena, to come, in this, come within the context of the modern centralized nation-state. Come in the context of a state that has a bureaucracy that controls every single aspect of your life. So you can demand the state to do this or to do the other thing and whatever. Or not. But it's a whole new context, because you didn't have such an all-encompassing state before that. Now you have borders and you have citizenship. Again, it didn't really exist that the way we understand it, although there was you know, Roman citizenship, but it was someone that didn't mean that you couldn't go into Rome if you weren't a citizen. Of course not, right? And, and so on. So there are many... This is, this, is, this is why, actually, the modern political ideologies are all the same in many ways, because they all deal with the same realities. And remember, what I want you to emphasize and you to get, this is why we started from Plato. This isn't reality. This isn't the absolute, ultimate, only possible reality. This is the reality of the last two centuries. It's nothing, historically speaking, nothing. It's yesterday's joke. So, I want you to have that understanding. Because otherwise you're caught in, in, this, in the today and say, well, this is how it should be. Even worse, you can be caught in your specific little political system or political culture and say, well, there's only two choices, this and that, there's only this, there's only that. No, there are many ways of doing things. So, um, your book discusses um, the major political ideologies pretty well, and I would recommend that you read it. <coughs> I will to give you some alternate uh, explanations. But your book talks about the, that these ideologies basically are built, uh, the major political ideologies are built around uh, a few uh, themes, right? All of them, why? Because they need to be coherent. So, and because they have a, they need to propose you a plan for how to live together as a society, you know, as any political philosophy, although they're not philosophies, they will start from basic questions, right? What is the human being, right? And what is the goal of the human being, right? What is the nature of the individual, uh, you know, life? then they will uh, also have to have an answer about what is the relationship between individual, society, maybe, you know, uh, the state, right? What is the place of the individual in this whole thing, right? In the society, in the state. So, one, what is the individual? Two, what is the connection between or relationship between individual and, and society and state, how it should be? And third, how in the modern state where all our citizens, 
how should we treat the citizens in the sense of um, how equal should they be? Should they be equal only in rights? Should they be equal in income? Should they be, you know, this idea of modern citizenship, you see how modern this is. The idea that everybody needs to be equal, although we are not equal, right? nobody is equal with another person, but in what sense should we, should we be equal? So, your book, and I recommend you read it, deals with the different political ideologies by talking how they respond, describing how they respond uh, to uh, these questions. Their view of the individual, their view of the society, and how the individual fits into it, and into the state, and third, their view on equality. So, read that. But let me, uh, while using some of that framework, let me present to you a slightly different frame. So, if the modern political world have started, has started um, around, you know, French Revolution, let's, let's put it that way. So the major thing is, with, you know, the Ancien Regime, which was the feudal model that we discussed, I'm not going to go back to discussing that, and then the modern model. Well, the 19th century is a key moment, and this is when two major answers to, the, to those changes come about. The one is conservatism, and the other is liberal. But guess what? It's not what you think it is. It's not what you think it is. So again, it is not what you think it is. Okay? Conservatism that occurs at the beginning of the, in the 19th century, this is 19th century, so it's 1800, let's push it to uh, 1900 here. You see, it's a larger portion here, because this is when, this is when <laughs> these ideas are formed. Conservatism, the original conservatism, was the ideology that wanted, what worked against this, all these new changes, against the modern nation-state, against uh, all these radical changes. It wanted to go back to the Ancien Regime. So it was based most on the idea of uh, organic society, against equality understood as everybody is equal, you know, because in the feudal regime not everybody was equal. A more organic view of society where not it's, you know, it's everybody is the same and then there's the state. No. They were against free market, which was a new invention, because that meant that you would let the, the economy decide the relationship in the society. Conservatism, the original conservatism, wanted to keep that sort of complicated, complex uh, picture of the society, remember from our previous lectures, right? In which, in a society, everybody has their place, but it's different. You have clergy and nobles, and the cities have their own rights. Their relationship with the, rule, with the ruling of, uh, power is different. So this city has a set of rights and, and, and duties. This uh, noble has a set of rights and duties that is different and their family. These uh, peasants here have a relationship with the noble and a different set of rights. It's a more complex, organic relationship. But what, what, is, what is very important for a conservative, and Edmund Burke, for example, is a typical, you know, uh, original conservative, is that, and again, it doesn't mean what it means in the U.S. today, okay? So it's, let's be very clear. Uh, they hated this idea that we have this strong state that forces everyone, that deletes all the relationship between the individual, all the intermediary uh, steps between the individual and, and the government. Let me rephrase this. In the modern state, there is nobody between you and the state. Nobody. Well, let me repeat. There is nobody between you and the state. This is why you have citizenship. Because citizenship is your direct relationship to the state. There is nobody protecting you in that sense. All that you have is decided by this relationship. All that you have. All that you have. That's all you have. There is no barriers between the state. The state can reach and grab you. It, even, you know, in the US as anywhere else. Because you individually have a relationship with the state. By virtue of citizenship. And that's what makes you equal. Because the state imposes the same relationship on everyone. That's the modern state. It frees everyone by putting them into a relationship with itself. An equal relationship. But you see the, pro the potential for problems. <laughs> Now, what was different before? Different before was that you didn't have a direct relationship with the, whoever was the ruler. You were part of a larger thing, which was maybe your guild, maybe your, your, your uh, uh, um, class, maybe your, your standing, your profession. Right? You were, you know, the, the shoemakers, they had their own guild, and the guild uh, 
had a relationship with the, with the power. And this was a relationship that was inherited through history. I mean, accumulated rather. Right? The same, a city here had accumulated a certain set of relationships. And those rights were maintained and accumulated and obligations and so on. So you were, there were layers between you and whoever was in, in power. And whoever was in power had to respect these accumulated. It didn't, it wasn't up to, to this man, person in power to define this relationship. Because they preceded him or, or, or the, the given government. They have been accumulated through history. Today it's the state who defines your relationship with it. And you say, well, so wait a minute, it's democracy, we decide. Well, again, we all know how that happens. Nobody asked you if you want to be in this constitution, which you are. Nobody. Nobody. You were born, you were here. Right? But nobody asked you if you agree. Did you, did you vote for the constitution? No. Yeah? So, uh, there, is a, <laughs> you know, there is a democratic part. But overall, right? there is a, there's a framework within which you find yourself. Um, and that doesn't, it's not really you who defines it. But the advantage, right, of course, is equality, is, uh, you know, a, a classless society, everybody is on their own. Right? But you see, my point here, and I'm not trying to, uh, you know, I'm trying to show you both sides and different sides, right, to understand the differences, not, not to make a point, by the way, because Clearly, we know what the advantages are of, of this system, right? But there are also disadvantages, and I, that's not even what I'm trying to point out, but the differences and the possibilities and the fact that it's very recent. But the conservatives, right? So they were for this, for a more organic, more layered, more, uh, 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 you know, um, a society based on a system of relationships that was developed organically and which the state kind of the state, the, the, the government, the people in power kind of stood back and acknowledged it, right? Liberals is what you are and what we are. Because, for example, oh, the parties that we have, for example, in the United States, they're liberal, both of them, in the classical sense. Because what did the liberals stand for from the, the name? For freedom. Freedom of the individual. That's and notice that this is the, you know, the, the, the buzzword for both parties, for example, in the U.S. Freedom. One says, you know, freedom, economic freedom, you know, freedom of enterprise. The other one says freedom to do what I want morally or whatever, but it's freedom. Now, this idea that of freedom, this idea of the individual, this emphasis on individualism, of the individual. I told you this is a recent invention in human history. This word, individual, didn't exist. What they use is person, and person is not an island. But this comes with the idea that, oh no, we're individuals, we're like an island. Of course, biologically we aren't, Socio social sociologically, psychologically we aren't, because we would die, you know, um, literally, and we would not develop as human being, we could not exist. But this is the, the, the ideology. Liberalism, classical liberalism, we're talking about classical liberalism. Right? This is why I'm saying this is not what you think it is. Classical liberalism is the ideology of the modern world, of the idea that human beings are individuals, that freedom is the highest value, and if you let them already be free, to a degree, right, then things will go well. And this is why they're also for the free market, they invented the free market, they, they were the major proponents against the conservatives, because the free market is what? Freedom of the individual doing whatever they want, and then everything will fall into, into place. And then, the state. Well, ironically, the liberals also needed a strong state to make everybody free <laughs> and individual. I just told you, right? I just showed you through a direct relationship of the state with the individual. And it's the state who makes you free because who protects your freedoms? The state. The government. I have my rights because they're in the Constitution. Really? Who protects them? The state. United States government. You demand the courts to protect your rights. Which means that the courts are part of what? The government. Courts are part of the state. Your freedom is defined by laws. Passed by who? By the state. In which you exist. By the institutions of the state in which you exist. This is why I remember the definition of state. A set of institutions in power over territory and membership. Clear borders, membership. In direct relationship with the state. So the state is needed to free you. Because I told you, the worst thing that can happen is to lose citizenship. Then you're nobody. 
Nobody gives you those rights and freedoms because whatever rights and freedoms you have, even if you claim to have them from God or by nature, well, actually, who enforces them? You claim them from the embassy, you claim them from the courts. It's a, it's a government, it's a state. So these are the two major directions that formed, and this is the ideology of the modern world and the ideology of the old world. Yes. So as you see, we live in a liberal world. This is why we call it the liberal democracy in which we live. Again, forget the US parties and how they use these words, right? Doesn't matter. We're talking about ideologies in the modern world. Not in the US, not in France, not in Germany. In the modern world. And we'll see then how they tr get transformed in each different case, okay? Good. Well, there's a third, but there are other movements. So 19th century, see, this is where most of these currents are formed. Another important one is, around the middle of the century, is uh, socialism. And remember, guess what? Socialism is, again, not what you think it is. <coughs> it's not Marxism. Socialism existed way before Marx. Well, not way before, but before Marx. Marx was just a thinker, right? And he's not the father of socialism, I think. So it's not what you think it is. But socialism was a third set of uh, responses to modernity. And it came mostly from the, as a response to the, to the uh, problems of the modern urban uh, life, uh, industry, the modern economy, uh, and all the, the inequalities and harsh lives, uh, life that, that, that happened then. So it, it's also modern ideology, but it goes against some of these. So when the liberal emphasizes the individual, and freedom, the, the socialism, and this is where social comes from, emphasizes the social part. But not the way the conservatives, in the, in the original conservatism, classical liberalism, classical socialism, classical conservatism, okay? Edmund Burke, you know, is conservative. <coughs> um, for uh, uh, <coughs> for uh, liberals, uh, Adam Smith uh, is a name, John Locke, right? Jeremy Bentham, John Stuart Mill, Hayek, Friedman, and so on. So socialism would be, the idea with socialism would be, instead of emphasis on individual and freedom, is the emphasis of, on, the, on the good of the whole, of the society. Now, of course, what today is socialism, not necessarily exactly that, but that was the idea, right? The good of the whole, but not this whole. It's a more, it's a uniform goal. So they accept this idea of everybody is the same, and there's a strong state, because they want the state to enforce that. Equality. They want the state to level the playing field. I mean, indeed, the, the situation of, for example, the working class in the beginning of industrialization was, I mean, beyond horrendous. Beyond horrendous. There were no protections in terms of, you know, you know, you, you all know, you know, work hour limit and uh, child uh, children working and child labor and all, all that. You know, weekend there was no weekend. By the way. Um, so original. Uh, socialism was about the idea that the state needs to, 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 to uh, act. Right? This whole, again, it's, these both, both are modern, this is, this is prima. Uh, the state will create, will act, and will balance the playing field between the individuals in the interest of the whole, for the common good. Right? Now, out of this, there are also some other reactions to modernity that come about. And let's put this here, communism, which develops, uh, anarchism, and libertarianism. Let me deal with anarchism and libertarianism first. These are also in the 19th century. Anarchism is a, is a reaction also to the, to the modern uh, uh, context of this new and overbearing uh, state and government, you know, that now can rise your life. And anarchism simply um, does not want government. So that's, that's all there is. So no government is good government. No government is the solution. The problem is the government. So to, to synthesize it, and your book has other definitions, uh, has a short discussion. But anarchism, remember, way before communism, it was a huge hit in the world. And many, you know, <laughs> anarchists have caused a lot of, they were the terrorists of the 19th century, literally. They have killed an emperor, uh, two or three presidents, uh, assassination attempts were daily, addressed at whom, obviously, rulers. Right? 
So they would, they would do that. Um, so that was the huge trend, but it was terrorism, basically. Uh, well, you know, one of the factions. Uh, libertarianism is, you see, is an off offshoot of these things here. But an offshoot that emphasizes individualism. Emphasizes in the individual as the absolute and freedom of the individual as the absolute value. Against the role of the state, but for the role of the free market. Basically, it creates the uh, libertarianism is the idea of the absolute, well, let's push the individual freedom as far as we can, because the problem is that we don't let the individual be free enough. You see, it's a very modern idea. It talks about individuals, not persons, not human beings in a society, not organic communities of individuals who actually live in families, because that's the only place where they can live, and communities, and, and a city, and tradition, and all these things. Conservatism, right? No, it's, it's you're an individual, you're an island, and you have to be free, and that's, and if it sounds familiar, it's because it's obviously something that is part of your cultural world. And you might say, well, this is how it should be, because, well, that's, this is where we are. But it's, it's a sort of a taking the liberal principle to the utmost. That's libertarianism. Now, before um, I get to talk about communism and some other hard ideologies, right? Let me talk about two other versions that came about around the turn of the century from, from these other versions. So one is social democracy. And the other one is Christian democracy. Although they sound similar, they're very... Well, significantly different. That social democracy is basically socialist principles, but the important thing is that social democracy plays within the rules of the game. Not that socialism didn't here, but this is later after communism appears, and communism was obviously more radical. So socialism is for, puts as first, social democracy, puts first the principle of the common good, uh, and then uses the state to achieve that common good. This is why in, in countries where social democratic parties rule, the state, it, by the way, it accepts free market, they're all modern, these are all modern parties, all of them except for this one. That's one there. Um, they're, all they're all modern liberal parties in many ways, because they all start from this sort of a picture of, a, of, a, of, of the life, that it's individuals, the state, and whatever. So social democracy, yes, free market, but a free market that is regulated by the state, not nationalized, it's free market, and once again, social democracy is free market. Understand, it's not socialism, it's not communism. It's free market, but it's a more balanced free market, and the benefits of the free market are then redistributed to the population. So it's based on you know, a working free market, but the state plays a role in leveling the playing field, distributing the goods of the free market to more than just the, more, the richest ones, more than just you know, those who are uh, successful. Yeah. So that's, that's the point with the social democracy. Now, Christian democracy is, is different. Christian democracy came as a result, in many ways, of uh, the Catholic Church uh, trying to respond to these, these changes. Right? Uh, then, obviously, it's not just Catholic, but it was an important part at the beginning. Now, you know, it's not you know, Catholic-specific or anything. But it's, it's you know, um, it, that's the origin of the 19th century. So it's, it's, let's give a response to all these things that just happened, this new modern state, individualism, whatever, the working class problems, and so on. So key documents were written, uh, Rerum Novarum is an important one, if you want to look it up, Rerum Novarum, um, by Leo XIII. Um, but what it is, it's a response to this new situation from Christian principles. This is why it looks like a little bit like conservatism here, because it puts an emphasis on family, puts an emphasis on, on, on moral values, protection of the family, puts, uh, puts the emphasis on the good of the individual as part of, of the community, as part of the family, and family is very important, and as part of um, um, a society whose common good we actually have to promote. Right? <clears throat> this is why you know, it's you know, nice with free market and all this, but it's not a wild free market. It's not a wild individualism like libertarians. Right? It's not a wild freedom. Because there is a good and there is an evil. And there is a common good and there is a common evil or a common bad. You know? So Christian democracy is based on these values. It respects tradition because it respects the history of, of human beings. It puts a value on family. It puts a, uh, promotes certain values. Right? 
within the context of a free market, uh, within the context of a state that is not an absolute value, yeah? um, and again, not looking at the individual as an, as an individual, but as a human being, as a person. So it's based on Christian principles, and uh, so uh, respects tradition, uh, and also you know, uses all this uh, for the common good. Now, uh, let's then, so you see this is the 19th century, so originally there are a few major stages here. There's the original break between the, between the ancien regime, the old regime, yeah, with the new modern state. In the early major break is those who wanted back to the ancien regime, Edmund Burke was one, uh, and the liberal world. Right? of which we are a part. Right? Freedom, individual, all these things. Socialism was another aspect. So this is, you see, a, a, an initial sort of a division. And then you have off offshoots, because anarchism, libertarianism, social democratization, these are sort of varieties coming out of these, of these tensions. Right? And also around this time come about certain hard ideologies. Hard ideology, what do I define by hard ideology? I don't want to erase this, so I'll just uh, try to present them to you. Hard ideology, in the, in the, in the strong sense, is um, a narrative, a meta-narrative. It's a narrative about the world, an all-encompassing narrative. It is a set of ideas that claims to explain everything. It takes one aspect of the world and explains everything through that aspect. That's one thing, it's a meta-narrative. Second, it's a moral philosophy. Uh, an, a, a hard understood ideology is a moral philosophy in the sense that it, it tells you exactly good and evil. It is a story about good and evil. And based on its explanation of the world, it tells you exactly what's good, what's evil. And third, it is also a political action program. It sets up to clear the world of evil and let it just go. So it has an explanation about the world based on one aspect, then it sets itself to divide the world into good and evil based on that aspect, and then it sets out to clear the world of evil. Now, look around you, listen to the current discourse, and you'll see that many ideological overtones. Many of these tones where I say, if only we get rid of that, if only we make these people do this. Now, notice that in modern, this thing, the hard ideology, I, I told you it's a political action program. Notice that a hard ideology is not possible without the modern state or a strong state. Because it sets out to clear the world. Well, who sets out to clear the world? Well, you need something for it. What? Institutions. Meaning what? You need strong state or strong government. Clearing the world means that you have a set of institutions that you, that you use, political institutions that you use, to cleanse the world. That's what modern ideologies do. They use political institutions to clean the world. And we all have it in us. And in every single ideology there is a dimension of this. Except maybe in the traditional conservative, who are more relaxed about this. But in every single modern ideology there is this idea that, well, uh, this is how we should do it, and wait, by the way, we have government, we have the state, let's actually do it. Right? There's all this... You know, this is why uh, another aspect of uh, hard ideologies is that they're utopian. Utopia. They are aiming towards a utopia. U-T-O-P-I-A. Right? A perfect world. Hard ideologies look at the world, realize it's disordered, remember political philosophy, and then propose a, a solution to it that will solve that disorder. Using the state to solve it. And that's what, once you solve it, what do you get? Perfect world. So the world can be perfect if only we eliminate the imperfection. But who can do it? You need institutions. Let's use the government, the institutions, police, security forces, secret police, army. Let's shoot those who are not. Let's, let's convince them. Let's re-educate them. Let's torture them. Let's, let's clean them. Let's arrest them. Let's impose on them to think right. Let's eliminate the evil using politics. You see, it's in every single political ideology. But notice that it wouldn't have been possible in a pre-modern world. How? 
You didn't have such an all-encompassing system of power, right? Plus, the view of the world was different, right? Think Augustine, again. Right? Think our political philosophy discussion. Could he have imagined clearing the world of evil? Of course not. He knew that the division between good and evil is not in the society. It's in the human heart. It's a choice that everyone makes every single moment. To the moment you die. And is perfect society possible? Of course not. Of course not for Augustine, for Aquinas, or whatever. It's not possible because it's broken. Idea, you know, it's not good because it's, there's evil. It's the same question we have discussed from the beginning of the course. Why is there disorder? Why is there order? How do you how do you manage this? I know that there's order because I know that there's disorder. Unless I know what's right, I have a sense of it. I can't say that something is wrong. And I know that these coexist, so how do I make something right? And here remember Plato and the idea of creating the ideal city. And here remember Aristotle and his rejection of the idea of creating an ideal city. And remember that Plato did what? He said, let's put in charge someone who can force everyone to play their role and so on. This is why some accuse Plato of being the original ideal of weapon. They don't really get what Plato was saying. They don't really get what Plato was saying. Uh, because uh, remember what the philosopher was in Plato, I'm going to close this parenthesis, right? Is the person whose soul was transformed uh, by the good. Right? Uh, and, um, well, and you can never, he, he was not the good, he was not the measure of the good. And that's very important in Plato. The philosopher is never the dictator because he's not the measure of the good. Right? He is in pursuit of the good. Well, an ideologue thinks that he knows what's good. The absolute measure, he can make these distinctions and he has the right, knowing this distinction, to eliminate those who are against. Does it mean that we shouldn't do anything? We shouldn't have laws, shouldn't have laws against crime and whatever, because that's, you know, that's an implementation of the tools of the state against what we think is right and wrong. Anarchists would say, yes, that's what it means. So, that's what a hard ideology means. And it's obviously, this is why it always happens with creates suffering and, and, and bloodshed. Because it always sets out to use the instruments of the power of the state to clean the world, to create utopia. Well, what are some of these ideologies? Uh, around the end of the 19th century, with uh, Marx and whatever, comes about, we mentioned communism. And communism, what is the major explanation it proposes for the world? Right? It says there's inequality, uh, of, which is caused by what? Economy. By the economy. And throughout history there has been inequality because some people owned the means of production and some didn't. And it's this difference in ownership that creates all suffering and oppression. If we remove the idea of property, we remove the cause of conflict, we remove the cause of oppression. So the ideal society is a society without property, without individual property, but with common property uh, um, and a classless society, and that removes suffering from the society. That's, that's the idea of, of, that's the essential idea, but since you can't, um, but it does, it's obviously more complicated than that, as who's going to work and how, and when they try to actually implement it, it turned out that, well, nothing really worked, because when everything belongs to everyone, actually it doesn't belong to everyone, because it belongs to whom? The state, because who do you use to implement this new classless society? The very powerful state, right? So actually it's the state who is most powerful, so actually it's those who are in power who are most powerful and they're going to rule the world. And that's what happens. Uh, but there are many problems because there's clearly evil. What's evil in a communism? People who have property. And then you have, you know, Stalin and uh, in most communist countries, the people who had, you know, were okay, not rich, but okay, would get deported and arrested and whatever because they were the oppressors, right? They were actually the more diligent ones. Um, and then you have uh, the question of, well, and in, who are the ones who, well, the problem with ideology is that you can never be sure. You can never be sure who's with you and who's against you, because where does, where does, where do positions get formed in someone's, uh, for someone, from, for a person, right? How does a person, uh, how do you know exactly what a person thinks? That's the question. Well, you can't. So then you start controlling and really investigating who thinks what, and who says what. 
Because you want to eliminate the, the evil. But evil starts in the soul. <laughs> evil starts in the mind. You decide before you act. Right? And you need to eliminate evil. We need to eliminate those. And who is evil? Evil are those who don't agree with our ideology. Because we have the answer to everything. To everything. Right? Nobody would say that. Conservatives wouldn't say that. Christian Democrats wouldn't say that. To everything. Right? But ideology proposes an answer to everything. So, communism. Right? And there were many experiments and in every single one of them, you know, the state became the most powerful thing and those who ran, ran the state, actually those at the top, used brutal methods to eliminate all the potential enemies, including those who could be enemies and those who thought enemies and this is why you had strong secret police and whatever. That's what happens in the 20th century in many, many countries. Um, communism. Then you have um, um, nationalism. Nationalism is another powerful ideology coming around about around here and yes nationalism is an ideology now differentiate here between nationalism and patriotism they're two different words two different conference concepts and i want you to differentiate them although they're not differentiated usually in this uh, political culture patriotism is being proud and comfortable with your identity yeah and it's an it's a with your national identity but a national identity that is um associated with statehood, with citizenship. You know, patriotism, I'm, I'm, I'm proud in my statehood, I'm proud in my citizenship, I'm proud in my national identity. But remember that nationality can be defined in many other ways. There's a political definition of uh, nationhood, we talked about this, right, France, and there's an ethnic definition of nationhood. And the ethnic definition is exclusive, right? So many times nationalism is associated with ethnic, is actually ethnic nationalism, because you're, you're, you can be with ethnic nationalism, you can either be German or not German. With political nationalism, once you become a citizen, right, you're American. You don't have to be ethnic this or that. Right? That's political nationalism. You're French because you have citizenship. But you have to be ethnic German to be really German. So, ethnic, ethnic nationalism versus political nationalism. Ethnic is exclusive, right? But what is nationalism? Nationalism is a hard ideology because it is this idea, again, what is an ideology that I know what's right and what, I know the cause of, of disorder, of what's wrong in the world. Once I have identified it, I extrapolate it, I generalize it to the entire world, and then I use political means to clean the world. Well, nationalism does the same with nation. It puts the nation on a pedestal. The nation becomes the be-all, end-all of everything. Once we're all this pure nation, once we have a pure nation and it governs itself, everything is going to be fine. What we need to do, though, is to eliminate those who are not with us. And if it's ethnic nationalism, it's those who speak a different language, it's those who are, uh, have a different race, it's those who uh, infiltrated us and, oh, look at here, we have these people who speak a different language in what should be our country. Because that's the ethnic nationalism, is that this idea of pure states, of pure ethnic nations, which do not exist. Do not and never have existed. We talked about this in the rise of the modern state. Right? There is no such idea. Pure, never had spin. Right? But this is what happens. And then what do you, what do you get? You get Yugoslavia. You get ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing, which is what? Eliminating ethnic groups to create a pure ethnic. But even the idea of ethnicity is a fantasy. Because you don't know your ancestry. You don't know the ancestry. The fact that they speak the same language now doesn't, it doesn't mean that they're part of a family. Right? These are all... Projections, right? There might be, there are connections. There are even genetic connections, but it's not an absolute. It's not a pure thing. And this is why you have then racism or ethnic nationalism turning into racism in Hitler's Germany, Nazi Germany, which was national socialism. It was basically nationalism transformed into racism. Because if you take the ethnic principle to the utmost, it becomes race. Because you go to the DNA and the skull shape and whatever, and blonde and tall, and those are the pure ones. You see, it's, and what, why is it an ideology? Because it identifies the evil. The evil is the other. The other defined as, well, in this case, not belonging to your nation. Is, you see how modern this ideology is? Because it projects this idea that there is a nation that is absolute and the state has to belong to the nation. Never, never in history has it, was it like this. Especially not ethnic in this sense. And so nationalism. Then you have later here in the 20th century fascism. 
Now, fascism is not Nazism, I'm not going to go into detail with fascism, you have it in your book, but it, it was a Nazi. Nazi is a different thing. Na National Socialism and Fascism were two different ideologies, even if connect, uh, related or you know, in friendly terms, but they, they weren't the same thing. Fascism was in Italy. It's this idea of society as an organic whole, uh, led by a leader, but it, it's emphasizing the nation, emphasizing the state, the modern state, so definitely not conservative. Uh, emphasizing the state and the state is the tool of the nation and the grandeur of the state and the leader who leads this organic whole of the of the nation. Very modern. That's fascist. Later on, so you see this is 20th century. So let's not get to the end yet. So the World War II is actually a turning point because after World War II the dominant uh, ideologies become literally uh, social democracy, uh, center-left, a center right that could be Christian democracy or could be a sort of a traditional conservatism that has accepted the modern state as in Britain. So that's kind of how, what you had in Britain. Or in the US, two liberal, two liberal uh, parties, yeah, because they're both for freedom and individual and free market, but leaning more to, to, towards, well, a bigger role for the state or a lesser role for the state in the part where they are for freedom. So if the, in the US you will see a party saying the economic freedom down with the state, the other one will say moral or social freedom or whatever down with the state. Let us you know, smoke marijuana or whatever. Right? And that's part, that's it. That's part of it. You know? It's based on individual freedom. Two liberal versions. And both of them want a weak state in the area where they're concerned about freedom, and a strong state in other areas. The conservatives in the U.S. will want, not conservatives, but you know, the right, center-right, uh, will want um, a strong state in the military. Very strong state in the military. Right? Very powerful, very active. The center-left, or the left a little bit, will want a strong state in managing society to, to a degree. Well, but free market dominates and whatever. I'm not going to go to the U.S., but I'm talking about the fact that after World War II, things become more, you know, certain ideologies fall apart. Like, you know, communism continues, but then, and so on. Um, okay, let's jump to the 80s, because in the 80s, 70s, 80s, you have the, the rise of new social, new movements, new political movements. These are the newest ones. It's sort of, they're called post-material, or post-materialistic. Because their concerns are no longer about how to distribute money, who gets the money, equality, but they're about other values. And here you have ecology, so ecology-minded parties, even now, um, uh, which is a typical uh, party from the 80s, where the major value is the protection of, of the environment, and guess what, they're very successful, and other parties have picked up on their, on their um, uh, themes. Even more recently, the 2000s, basically, you have the rise of the eco so ecology is one. You have a resurgence also of nationalistic. So nationalism never goes away. Nationalism re remains a, a key, you know, even ethnic nationalism, a key thing that is even now today is very popular in the 80s as a resurgence of nationalism. For a couple of decades, you know, they were after Nazi Germany. They were kind of let's not let's not go that nationalistic. But nowadays. Uh, especially in Western Europe, nationalism, there are nationalistic groups that are very powerful. And again, in the hard sense, not patriotism. Not patriotism, which is, I'm fine with, you know, my culture, my, who I am, my, the state I belong to, and so on. Um, it's not exclusive, patriotism. So, in the 2000s, you have even newer movements, which are uh, mostly basically on direct democracy, and there are sort of reactions to direct democracy, reactions to the whole system. And they're hard to, to, to put in one box, but this direct democracy uh, is key to it because you see them under the name of pirate parties. Yeah, there's pirate parties all over Europe. Very, I mean, some of them more successful, but actually most of them very tiny. But it's their ideology. And yes, it comes from the word, pi word pirate, but not the pirates of Somalia, but pirates is piracy on the internet. There are parties that ad advocate individual freedoms um, and direct democracy, meaning using the internet, meaning let me be free to directly participate in government, let me be free to directly check on government, let me be free to do all of these using modern technology. So that's 
democracy in that sense. So this is why you have party is like private, like the private parties, but also the, in Italy the Five Star Movement, which actually created a whole party on the internet and actually was very successful. That quarter of the seats in parliament in the last election, and one is now is one of the major parties in Italy. So this idea of technology, using technology to democratize, to remove to remove old parties and just directly people running themselves. So, you see a whole palette, a whole uh, genealogy of political ideas, of modern political ideologies. So the, our next step then will be to talk about, to look at the four countries we have studied and see how this plays out. How these electoral systems we have discussed in the previous lecture and how these ideologies manifest themselves. Because otherwise it won't make sense. Because what you have to understand is that there are no absolutes. That in every single state, in every, <coughs> you will have a political culture that is a result of, of the phenomena, the history, the experiences of those people, the choices, the electoral system they have, the political system they have, parliamentary, which will shape the options that they have. And the different, these experiences from history and what people think about politics, which remember is political culture, what they expect uh, that politics can do or should do will differ from different state to state, from culture to culture. This is why you'll have different parties, more or less. Some will have two parties, some will have 20 parties. Okay? Because there's no absolute. If you want to understand the political system of a country, look at that country. You can look at the whole picture and it makes sense to connect dots, but you really have to understand the context. Good, thank you. And next then, party systems, looking at some case studies, and then we'll talk about what is democracy, kind of drawing the line and drawing some conclusions.